This is another our oral history interview with uh, broadcasters uh, in Jacksonville's history, and we're glad to have Deborah Giannolis with us. Uh, so Deborah, people who have been in Jacksonville for a while will remember you from Channel 12 and mostly, I would say, Channel 4. Absolutely. Uh, but let's talk about, let's go back before those uh, Jacksonville days. How did you get started in broadcasting? I had gone to the University of Maryland to be a teacher because they had a wonderful early childhood program and that's what I was sure I wanted to do. And I volunteered at the faculty daycare center in my first semester and knew this was not what I wanted to do. I've huh. always had great affection for and respect for the teaching profession and that confirmed for me how hard the job was. <laughs> so I actually came home and I took a semester off and I worked and I went to the University of Delaware, which is where I'm from, and took um, a course introduction to communication. I had always been an avid news watcher, not as much a reader when I was younger, although I read our local newspaper because it came every day. Um, and I, I read periodicals, but I wasn't reading you know, papers from all over the country and things like that. But when I was coming up in Wilmington, Delaware, we watched Philadelphia News. And the first, one of the first women anchors, Jessica Savage, was mm. on one of the Philadelphia stations. And a very well-known journalist, um, Cassie Mackin, got her, began, uh, got her beginning in Philadelphia um, TV journalism as well. So I saw these two women in a role that I'd never seen women in before. And what impressed me about it, as I reflect on it, when the men were out in the field or having these various experiences, I didn't connect with that. Hmm. Somehow when I saw a woman have these experiences of traveling and interviewing the mayor, and I thought, wow, that is so interesting. Wouldn't that be great to be able to know your community and learn about so many different things? And so I'm taking introduction to communication and I said, well, this is where I belong. I mean, it's everything I love. It's, hmm. it's, it's writing, um, it's speaking, it's um, storytelling, it's research. I just, I loved everything about it. And I really didn't know if I'd end up in sales or um, uh, advertising at that point. So I got a job at the college radio station in sales. My dad encouraged me that because to go there in that route because he was a salesman. Mm -hmm. And one day I walk into the television station at the University of, or the radio station at the University of Delaware, and they said, Oh, thank God you're here. Here, take this. And they ripped something off a wire machine and said, We're on in two minutes. Can you just read it? Nobody showed up to do the news. And I said, well, I, I don't know how to do the news. And they said, no, just, just read this. It's OK. And I, I, Harry, I have no idea what the story was. I, I don't know if it was national, international, local. I was scared to death. I, they flipped the switch. The red light came on. I read the story. And they had told me beforehand, just sign off with your name. And thank you very much. So I signed off with my name. And I just went, whew. Wow. And they said to me, well, you're pretty good at that. And I said, now, I'm, I'm here to do sales, and they said, we really would like you to, to come and, and, and think about doing the news. So I came in for a training session, and they told me how to get an actuarial. I had no idea what that was. What they meant by that was I was going to do an interview with somebody over the telephone, and they called that an actuarial. Hmm. And that would be part of my radio report. And I thought, wow, OK. So the, one of the first people I had to call was the mayor of Newark, Delaware. And he took my call. And I was, I was all in. I was all in. I could not believe that the mayor of Newark, Delaware would talk to a 19-year-old girl. So uh, right then and there, you switched your career goal. That's correct. I knew then that I wanted to go with the journalism route. This was before Mary Tyler Moore? It was at the same time. Same time. time. Okay. It was at the same <laughs> time. Yes, it was. And. You know, reading so much about Mary Tyler Moore uh, in the wake of her death, I never knew the, the issue to wear pants. All of that seemed so 
normal when I was watching it on TV. It never occurred to me that wasn't appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I still remember, this happened twice at Channel 4, I would get calls and somebody would ask me what the time was in Australia or in Bangkok or something. And I would say, well, I, I really don't know. And they would say, well, just look at one of those clocks on the wall. <laughs> So people really right. did think that Mary Tyler Moore was real, yeah. and and um, I was pl pleased that I never had to work with the Ted Baxter. <laughs> I, I worked with a lot of people with a lot of credibility, like Mary had, and I did not, um, from my management at Channel 4, ever encounter any kind of um, sexism, if you will. And in fairness, I guess... Uh there are very few Ted Baxters. Uh. I think there are very few Ted Baxters, yes. Um, but yeah. he made for a fabulous TV character. And, um, and so my, my journey really began with getting thrown into doing a, tele, uh, a radio news broadcast and discovering that I could have access to the elected officials and to so many interesting mm -hmm. people and that my job was to tell their stories on, on behalf of, of, the, of the community. And that led you to change your major. Changed my major to journalism. Mm -hmm. And then the University of Delaware had a winter term. And during that term, the public station, which is actually licensed to Delaware, but mainly operates in Philadelphia, but it has a little tiny studio and they did a Delaware news show every night mm -hmm. that about five people watched. But <laughs> nonetheless, um, that was the local option. Um, they came and helped us put on our um, winter term TV so for three weeks and I auditioned and I was the anchor and um, we during that time also brought in some Philadelphia television journalists to tell us about how you get into the business and what I heard in those interviews and in those uh, workshops we did was you've got to have an internship so I went to the Dean and I said so where do we have an internship and he said well we we don't have an internship program hmm. And I said, well, can I start one? And he said, sure. So I went, I didn't have the guts to go to Philadelphia and ask if I could do one there. So I went to the little Delaware television station and they were like, oh my gosh, this is mana from heaven, right? So they said, absolutely. So they I never had an intern. Never had an intern. <laughs> so the first thing they did, at, the news director taught me how to write. And I, and I have to say that was the most valuable lesson I had more so than my college courses was having to write under that deadline of a daily newscast and I was soon I was writing news and then the weather person um, got sick and they said well could you just do the weather I said I don't know anything about the weather and once again they took it off the wire service and in those days instead of the magic markers that George was using we literally had a felt board you know, like kindergartners. So you would say, oh, it's a sunny day, and you would stick a sun up on the board. And so the very first weather um, broadcast that I did, uh, the felt didn't stick. And the <laughs> sun fell down. And I laughed, and I put it back up, and I went on with the weather. And I remember the news director later saying, you're a natural you should do this. This You're very good at this and we want to help you. So how would you like to produce a series um, and report a series um, on a local issue? And it was actually on funding for the fire department. And they weren't used to women. Um, and at that point, I was very much a young lady. <laughs> Needless to say, there were no female firefighters. There were certainly no female firefighters. So I was, um, I was 20 at this stage, so I was just out of being a girl. But those gentlemen could not have been nicer to me. Um, I rode with them, uh, and I had a, one of the uh, producers from the television station help me, and we did a five-part series, which became my resume tape, along with the anchoring that I had done um, during Delaware winter term. And then when it was time to look for a job, um, I created a resume, and I had my picture in the corner. And I remember my Dean saying, I really don't think that's wise to put your picture in the corner. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, you certainly don't want to um, suggest that you should get a job based on your looks. And I said, well, I'm on television. I'm applying for jobs in television. And I said, I just think it might be helpful to me and might distinguish my resume if 
I can't afford to send tapes to everybody. I only can afford to buy four. <laughs> I said, so I'm going to send them something, and I, I had self-addressed postcards and stamped, and if they wanted to see a tape, they could send it to me. Oh. And that was, I thought I was going to make it as easy as I could for a potential employer. And um, I had many people tell me, thank you for the picture and for the postcard. So my dean was wrong, um, and my dean had been wrong about not having an intern program. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes you've got to take a little initiative. Yeah. And, and I think that I learned that early on. And then Channel 4, um, and actually Channel 12 when I first started there and became the first weekday female anchor in Jacksonville, um, I had no idea, honestly, that I was taking so much initiative um, until I look back. And I think that's really something that, you know, I, to me it just sort of fell into place. So uh, you were applying for jobs uh, out of college. Yes. And the, the, at Channel 12 ended up being that job. Yes, and actually I had two interviews in Jacksonville, Channel 17 and Channel 12, no bites from Channel 4. And I had interviews, that Channel 17 was interested, but they weren't interested in flying me here. Um, I could come on my own if I wanted to. Channel 12 flew me here. And my ethics said that I would only speak to Channel 12 because it was unfair to go to Channel 17 on their nickel. So I never did talk mm -hmm. to Channel 17. Um, I drove to a station in Salisbury, Maryland, which was near my home, which had offered to give me an interview. And then a station in Bangor, Maine um, said if I'd like to fly up, they'd do an interview. But only Channel 12 mm -hmm. offered to fly me down. And I got off the plane, and there was a palm tree, and I said, yeah, this is going to work. <laughs> had, had you ever been to Florida? Once. Only once. Uh, Cocoa Beach. When I was a high school student with my best friend's family, we made the drive, you know, from Delaware. Mm -hmm. So we drove through Jacksonville. And so I had an idea. I knew where it was because of that one trip. But I, outside of spending, you know, a spring break at Cocoa Beach, I'd never been to Florida. So they offered you a job and you became a uh, reporter. I became a reporter. And uh, my first literally weeks on the job, um, the education reporter had to leave for a family emergency. And in those days, women at Channel 12 um, covered women's issues, which were considered sort of the social issues and education. And so this reporter left, and I was the newbie. And they said, um, well, you're going to cover education now. And I was like, okay. So the teachers union was threatening a strike and there were organizers coming in from all over the country and the collective bargaining sessions which this is how I learned about the Florida Sunshine Law. This would have been about what? This year? was 1976. Okay. 1976. So I knew so little about what I was doing that I attended every collective bargaining session in addition to working full time. Mm -hmm. So if they went to midnight and I had to be at work at eight, I, I just thought, I have to learn this. And it was the earliest days of live television. The stations had just gotten their live trucks and so they were very anxious to use so them. So you could do remotes. So you could do remotes. So they threw me yeah. in front of a live camera and it didn't occur to me to be scared or to not know what to do because it was one of, I had only been doing this job a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So I ended up being live most every night while there were demonstrations and reporting on the um, collective bargaining negotiations. Um, and one of my earliest memories of covering that whole process was an evening story I was working on and the anchor from Channel 4 Tom Wills came up to me and he said, hi, I want to introduce myself. I want to tell you I've been very impressed with your reporting and I want to ask for your help because I think you know more about this than anybody else. <laughs> and he said, would, would you sort of tell me what the lay of the land is here because I haven't covered this before. Hmm. And I said, sure. And that was my, my first encounter with Tom Wills. Or anyone else at Channel Four, I guess. No, I had um, I had been on other stories, um, and Marlene Schneider uh -huh. and Bill Baxter. Uh -huh. um, there were there were definitely reporters that I followed, and they followed me. And uh, Bill Baxter actually asked me on a date once. Um, that didn't work out because I was already dating David Heald. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
Okay. And uh, were there other women in the newsroom at Channel 12? Um, yes, Sharon McClama was the other woman in the newsroom. And then the woman that I ended up covering for never came back to the station. And honestly, she, her name was Tony something. I can't really remember now. Yeah. Um, but literally one other woman. And then it, at Channel 4 was Marlene Schneider, who was extremely well known in mm -hmm. the community. And Marlene got to cover City Hall. And that was huge because that was considered a man's role. And, and so, she was the first. And she was the first. Yes. And, and that told me something about the management at Channel 4. And I had done my homework, so I knew it was a Washington Post station. And I knew that Kay Graham run the Washington Post. And I figured that might have something to do with it. Indeed. And the next chapter is Channel 4. The next chapter is Channel 4. You uh, ended up at Channel 4. Uh, Tell us how that happened. When I was at Channel 12, I met my now husband of nearly 40 years, my first day on the job. And David was a reporter, and we were soon dating. And then he got a scholarship to go to school in London. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to marry him. Actually, as he tells it, I asked him to marry me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to... I didn't want to be apart from him for a year. He didn't want to be apart from me for a year. I said to him, well, there is one way yeah. to cover this problem. And um, so we decided to get married and got married in two, three months' time. My mother was frantic because I was the first girl in the first wedding, but she did a great job. Mm -hmm. And so we lived in London for a year, and during that time I worked for UPI, United Press International, which of course doesn't exist anymore, um, as a radio reporter. While he went to school. While he went to school. Mm -hmm. and. I actually was on American television a couple of times, my voice, not my, my face, because the Independent Television Network at that time um, was looking for an American voice to do their uh, stories from London. So it was pretty cool. I, I got to cover Margaret Thatcher's election um, as a voice. And I never got to meet her or go to anything, but it was, it was pretty cool that I, I got that, ex or that, that I got that experience. And we were probably early spring of that year, and we got a telephone call in London um, from Channel 4 that they would like to talk to me about coming back and working at Channel 4, actually to both David and I. And I said, well, we're not going to be back in the States until the end of the scholarship, which was late in the summer. So they said, well, we'll come to you. So sure enough, the general manager and news director flew to London. Uh, general Manager Amy McCombs, one of the first women general managers in the country, mm -hmm. and they took us to um, the Ritz for tea, which is not an experience I had ever had, <laughs> and I'll never forget it because I thought, what do you wear to the Ritz for tea? And we talked about them offering us both jobs, and so that wasn't what was in our plan at all. We had put all of our stuff in Jacksonville in storage thinking, well, we'll probably never come back to Jacksonville again. We'll just get the stuff when we, wherever we go. So that offer made me want to talk to my Channel 12 general manager who had been so good to me. As a matter of fact, when, when I left Channel uh, 12 to marry David, uh, the station actually gave me a bonus and I was breaking a contract. Um, and I thought that was pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I tried to reach Gert Schmidt and he was actually on a cruise. And in those days, you couldn't make a telephone call <laughs> to a boat in the middle of an ocean. Um, so I could not reach Gert. Yeah. And when the station got wind of the fact that I was going to be um, talking with Channel 4, they, their news director then called me. And the news director had changed, so I didn't even know the players, really. Um, literally, in a year's time, things had changed. And as it turned out, as we were trying to negotiate with Channel 4, we ended up coming home um, for a wedding that we didn't know about at the time. And so Channel 12 met us at the Philadelphia airport and interviewed us in a hotel. And I'll never forget it, because I had been the anchor there. Channel 4 made it very clear that I would be anchoring with Tom Wills and that we would be co-anchors, that we would be equal in all regards. Um, when I went to the interview with Channel 12, 
they made it clear that I would be what they called the sub-anchor. Now, I had previously been a co-anchor. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't hard. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't hard. And there was a big headline in the newspaper here, I remember, about you know bidding war between the stations. And I laugh about that because I literally think the difference in the offer was maybe a thousand bucks. There really was not a bidding war. And when I, I finally then, Gert was home, mm -hmm. and I was able to call my former general manager, and he actually said to me, look, for your career, um, the opportunity to work for Channel 4, mm -hmm. um, I completely understand. He said, you know, the, the station has a magnificent reputation, and I think it's in your best interest. Again, mm -hmm. gracious, gracious man. Yeah. Um, so I had... Is it any doubt why I love this community? I mean, these were my earliest experiences. I met my husband here. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a phenomenal boss who literally, um, I sat across from Gert Schmidt when I had worked as an anchor for one year and I was 22 years old and they were bringing in a new anchor man and I read his salary in the paper and I went to my boss and I said, well, why is he gonna make twice what I make? And he said, well, he um, is married with five children. This is right out of the uh, MTM episode with uh, Lou Grant and Mary Richards. Honest to goodness. <laughs> Honest to goodness. And mm -hmm. All right, it's probably, I can probably just Google it now and find out, you know. Gosh. Well, when, so, okay. when I had been um, made anchor at Channel 12, um, I had a one-year contract. And I'm, I'm sure it was because they thought, well, this is pretty risky putting this 22-year-old on the air um, as a main anchor. So my contract was up. And at the same time, they were bringing in a new anchor man. And I read in the newspaper what they were gonna pay my co-anchor. So when I sat down to talk to my boss, he made me an offer which was a big raise. It was like from $12,000 a year to $15,000 a year. A very big raise. But I had read what my co-anchor was making um, and it was three times that. So I went to my boss and I said, you know, we're doing the same job. Why is he making so much more money? And Gert Schmidt said, well, he is a married man with five children <coughs> and a lot of experience in the business. And I said to him, well, I get the experience part I absolutely believe in. And I said, but I took one business course at my father's urging, and it was called personnel. Mm -mm. And I learned something in that course which is that you pay people for their job performance and that it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter what their family situation is, their living arrangements, their faith, their anything else. You pay for job performance. And I said, I think we do the same job. And this uh, exact episode was, uh, America saw this when uh, Mary Tyler Moore went in to complain about her salary. And I, now you, that you mentioned that, I'm wondering, had Gert seen that episode? But he literally leaned back <laughs> in his chair. If he did, they didn't learn anything from it. <laughs> well, except he leaned back in his chair and he said, you're right. And he doubled what oh. he was gonna pay me. And I, I did think, I, and I still believe that experience warrants more yeah. money. I don't think there's any question about that. You, you know, the old Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hours of practice, there's mm -hmm. really something to that, I think. And so um, that really enabled me um, to be, to start buying a wardrobe. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't afford any of those things before. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was, a, it was a really a terrific experience to have uh, my first boss be really so gracious and so open-minded and so fair. So you did go to work at Channel 4. I did go to work at Channel 4. And uh, it became a, a kind of legendary, uh, unlike a lot of television that we know about, uh, an anchor team that uh, was together for a long, long time. I th we were, when I retired, the longest running anchor team in American television history. Which included uh, Tom. Which included Tom, Tom Wills, George, George and Sam Kavaris. Yep. Sam came the year after me. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that record holds because the industry had changed so dramatically that the likelihood of four people being together mm -hmm. past that time, I think, was is very slim. And uh, in those days, Channel 4 was still doing what it became famous for. Uh, in the 60s, maybe late 50s, uh, investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, responsible in large part for some important changes in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Channel 4, uh, we did documentaries uh, for many, many years, mm -hmm. and we had in our ethic that our job was to hold our elected officials accountable to the people they serve. And we were all expected to know what was going on in all the meetings at City Hall and mm -hmm. all the, the authorities, JEA, JTA, certainly the school board, which was really my bailiwick. Um, although I was hired at Channel 4 uh, to be an anchor, it was always important to me that I remain a reporter. Um, and, and I can actually remember saying once, you know, no news happens in newsrooms. Mm -hmm. And if you're not out talking to people in the community, I never wanted to be out of touch in that way. And so Channel 4 really enabled me to do that, and I, and I appreciated it because mm -hmm. I never wanted to just, and I was very good in live environments, and you could put me live in the field, and that happened a lot, but some of the most remarkable opportunities that I had were obviously um, somewhere else, uh, from being on the USS Saratoga in the run-up to the war, um, a remarkable experience, some of the reporting that I did on desegregation mm -hmm. of schools, which allowed me to travel throughout the Southeast, um, the hurricane documentary that Tom and I did, um, you know, you think about the hurricanes today, it's always, oh, it's get your materials and, um, but we really did an investigation of what happens when people don't leave. And we went and to, to communities that had been devastated by hurricanes. This was before Hurricane Andrew, of course. Um, and then I, I was able to cover that. Um, so most of what I remember about my time with Channel 4 was encouragement to push the envelope um, to be very well informed about what was happening in your community, our state, and our world. Uh, we cover the legislature regularly. Um, and always a sense that we were all peers and that we were equally responsible to our community and to one another. Um, it was a very, it was a very um, nurturing and demanding environment to work in. Would you attribute some of that uh, gutsy journalism to uh, the Washington Post ownership? I don't think there is any doubt that the Washington Post ownership, I mean, we, I was growing up as a journalist in the days of Watergate. Um, obviously, the Washington Post was known throughout the country um, and the world for the tenacity at which they held our government accountable. And I don't think there's any question that that influenced the way we saw our role, and particularly around government corruption. Um, Ernie Mastriani was a big part of that in, in the Channel 4 days, and I think that knowing that we were part of that gave us an awful lot of pride. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess uh, one of the things that would be interesting to think about is the, uh, the fact that Th though still ratings dominance. Absolutely. Things were going to change in a little while because there was going to be cable and so forth, but there was ratings d dominance, and yet uh, the station was willing to take on some things that might have been inherently unpopular in the racial area. Correct. And uh, some other things that we could mention. And we lost a couple advertisers, as I recall, yeah. even in my era. Um, because we published stories and that that were not popular mm -hmm. um, with certain corporations, and but the station had the courage to do that, and I think that was really important. So we can assume the viewers didn't retaliate about something unpopular by not watching. That's right. But, <laughs> That's right. The ratings because the there. ratings continued, and um, I think I really do think people recognize authenticity when they see mm -hmm. it, and I think Channel Four was very authentic always, and still is. Anything, uh, any stories or issues that uh, you might think of that uh, we, I, I think race was a big uh, issue. Uh, desegregation of schools, uh, all of those kinds of issues that related directly to the racial dynamics of the South. And I, and I think too, Harry, that one of the things I learned at Channel 4 was to be compassionate. Um, in all situations. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, when the USS Stark was hit in a missile attack 
and it was based out of Jacksonville. Um, our news director at the time called us all in and said, no one is going out to Mayport to try to interview people to find out if they had anyone on the Stark. We knew 37 men had died. Mm. He said, as soon as we get those names and we know who the deceased are, we will then come up with an, a plan to offer those people an opportunity to talk about the lives that were mm. lost. And after that meeting, he called me into his office and he said, when we get the names, I want you to call the widows. Always one of the more difficult assignments to oh go my. and interview uh, I said, survivors. And even to call, I said, I said, Mel, I, I don't know how to do that. He said, look, they know you, they trust you. Mm -hmm. Many of these people are going to want to talk about the service that their husband, their dad, their father, their brother, their uncle gave to this country. And he said, it's our obligation to give them that opportunity. And when he put it in that context, and I had to nervously dial those, we dialed then, dial those phones, and to a person, I had the most remarkable experience of people being so grateful that we called. Some didn't want to talk, but some did. Um, we sent condolence notes to everyone. Um, it was, it was a really mm -hmm. difficult but very meaningful experience. Um, another time I remember was the GMAC massacre. You know, today in America, sadly, um, mass shootings have become routine. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a rare, rare occurrence, and there were eight people who were killed that day. And as fate would have it, the entire management of the station was not here. They were on their way to a Washington Post retreat. I believe they were on a bus going to Hilton Head. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who were left, um, we had to make a decision about how we were going to cover this. Again, communications then and now. And now, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, when they finally got to their destination and heard what happened, of course, mm -hmm. they wanted to know what are your plans, and they guided us, and we said, well, we're going we're to have to expand the newscast. Mm -hmm. and. The idea was to go to an hour instead of a half hour. And our news director, Steve Wasserman, said, I want you to do 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. I want you to start at 5, and I want you to go to 6.30. Mm -hmm. And Tom Wills was not here. Rob Sweeting sat in for Tom. And we dispatched reporters with police, we had psychologists come into the, uh, to the newsroom for um, live interviews. We, we thought of so many aspects of that, of that horrible crime, how uh, from the community perspective, the family perspective, the corporate perspective, um, obviously the police, the medical institutions, but, but how does a, a community grieve in this <coughs> circumstance? And we had no scripts, and so we were live just with the producers telling us in our ear okay we're going to go now to such and such reporter with this um, and so Rob and I um, did the 90 minutes and I thought our coverage was compassionate um, truthful non-alarmist um, it was an alarming story we didn't need to add any intensity to that and I was so proud of everyone. And I remember after the newscast, because I knew the station was thinking about expanding the news beyond the six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, folks, get ready. We're going to 90 minutes. Yeah. And that's what happened. You would have been at Channel 4 during the historic uh, license challenge. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Anything uh, you remember about that that was a difficult period of time. A difficult period of time. Uh, we knew we were on the right side of the law um, and uh, we but knew... But the political dynamics could change things. The political dynamics could change things, but we knew that locally we probably had a lot of support mm -hmm. um, and we knew that we had attorneys in Washington working very hard to make sure that the Nixon administration was not able to withdraw the license. Mm -hmm. um, I remember thinking, well, this can't happen. This can't happen. And it very well could have. 
I, I just knew how this community felt about this station. Um, I knew the integrity of the Washington Post Company. I don't think at that time I understood how really serious it was. And the challenge was to keep on doing what you were doing and not be in, having any uh, and so reaction. I, th I think the local management did a very good job of keeping us almost, you know, like you do with your children when something is going terribly wrong, you want to stay focused on what you're doing now. And, um, and, and we did. We stayed focused on our jobs. And you were at WJXT for 25 years? Almost 25, yeah. I came in October of 1979 mm -hmm. and then left in May of 2004. And let's talk a little bit about your post-broadcasting Uh-huh. Uh, Post-broadcasting, I discovered uh, my voice. Uh, when you are a journalist, it's very important that you, I believe, that you remain very neutral. Even though I think the station certainly had um, a commitment to justice. I do not consider that partisan. I consider that American. <laughs> um, today, I think you could argue that it, people would argue it's a partisan issue. But the station was on the front lines with um, civil rights, uh, with desegregation of schools. Um, and I, to me, that was supporting human rights and justice. And I, I was proud to work for a station that did that. Um, when I, because I had covered uh, schools so extensively, I my nonprofit work tended to be in the, in the education arena, and I got very engaged in early learning um, with Episcopal Children's Services and was on that board for 15 years and became chair of that board. Um, and then when we had the recession and school budgets were cut so dramatically, I got engaged with a community group and was a founder of something called Save Duval Schools that was an advocacy group that we worked for several years to try to get more funding, to try to get the legislature to back off on so many regulations that schools have. I mean, education is truly one of the most over-regulated industries in America, and the local control is often stripped away by the legislature's mandates. So we argued that we could, a lot of dollars could be re-diverted if, if home rule could have a say in how we use the, that money instead of the legislature had requirements that you had to purchase new textbooks on uh, in certain subjects at certain years. No doubt because the textbook industries have good lobbyists mm -hmm. um, and it was ludicrous. The year that we were eliminating music teachers from most, most schools, the district had to purchase new music books. Now, I don't think music changes dramatically from year to year mm -hmm. um, and you probably could have supplemented with um, a few things that were in those days practically available online, um, but no, they were buying new music books that sat there because uh, there weren't music teachers in the schools. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, some some of the some of the issues that that we faced as a in my journalism career impacted heavily what I chose to do in my um, in my retirement, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, then that. That job led to, um, it wasn't really a job, it was all volunteer, but I actually decided to run for state senate on an education platform. I did not win, uh, but I became more and more associated with education advocacy, and particularly public school advocacy. And then that led to me uh, becoming president and CEO of the Schultz Center for Teaching and Leadership. I'd been a board member for six years at that time. I was a chairman of the board, and uh, I had covered the opening of the Schultz Center. And I remembered how different school teaching was after the Schultz Center opened. And I began to go and see the kind of instruction that teachers were getting, the way schools were working together. Um, I remember doing a documentary and I had some teachers cry to me that this, this is the hardest work they've ever done in their life. Then I had others tell me, oh my, I've never seen my children move like this. Mm. For someone who doesn't know, uh, tell us what that uh, center. The Schultz Center was, uh, it's named after Fred Schultz, uh -huh. um, who was a 
true city father and, and community leader. And education was his, one of his big causes. Education was um, what Fred thought was essential for our economic prosperity and for our community to develop a culture of learning. We had been a blue collar town. We were one of the last big cities to get a university. Um, and Fred thought that if we were going to really prosper, the best way to do that was to have a reputation of having the best teachers in the country. This came out of a community effort in the late 90s called the New Century Commission on Education, which was really co-led by then Mayor Delaney mm -hmm. and University President, UNF President Adam Herbert, along with our school board. And there were, it was a, it was a remarkable effort, and I, I remember covering it as a reporter. And out of that came several recommendations. Adam Herbert was very smart in tapping community leaders to lead committees on certain key subject areas. And he put Fred in charge of teacher development. And the university then provide, provided all the research to the committees that were working on this and uh, to the community at large. And Fred had an aha moment when he read that the greatest single in-school factor in student achievement is the quality of the teacher. Yeah. It has, it's really not the school board and the superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really not the principal. Despite what they may think. It, it, exactly, and, and their job is to support and to make sure that every child has a high quality teacher in the classroom. So Fred learned that mm -hmm. most professional development um, was not very effective at giving teachers the support they needed throughout their career as particularly as information and technology was changing so rapidly as our standards kept going up and we expect more out of kids now. Um, you know, people will complain about our schools, but the reality is <laughs> kids are doing now in fourth grade what I did in seventh. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I applaud some of it and I vehemently disagree with the push down into pre-K and kindergarten of testing and um, away from a play-centered, um, exploratory kind of learning, but you know the good comes with the bad, right? So, so, so you've had an enjoyable and challenging post-broadcasting career. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. um, very challenging. I've never led a nonprofit. I'd never managed people, um, and when you lead a nonprofit, you manage up to your board and you manage down. And I, I won't say which is easier, but I'll leave you to guess. Um, <laughs> and and um, so yes, I've had a lot of growth uh, since I retired from television. And having a voice and, 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 and giving your opinion um, uh, was very liberating for me. I, I don't think I recognized how important it is to truly be who you are. And I was, I always thought of myself as being authentic on television. I was my true self. And, and one of the things I'm proudest of about when I think back of the way Tom and I worked together as such a team, if he were to say to me, or I were to say to him as we were writing our scripts for the newscast, can I say this? We knew we couldn't. We checked each other all the time. And particularly around education issues. I would say, can I say this? And I would read my script and Tom would go. And it was such a great check and balance because we took out emotional language, we made sure we were speaking clearly mm -hmm. um, based on evidence and that we had well represented stories. And one of the other things I really remember about reporting with Channel 4 was there's this tendency when you're with the assignment desk is your job is to fill up those hours, right? So your job is, okay, here, this just happened today, go get the other side, right? Go get the other side and come back and put the story on there. Now that you, uh, your connection with broadcasting is <clears throat> as a viewer, uh, not as a broadcaster, uh, what, what are your thoughts about uh, what's good, what's bad uh, nowadays uh, compared to the maybe good old days? You know, the 24-7 news cycle and the social media environment changed everything. Mm -hmm. It changed it while I was working, 
um, in the business and it's changing it every day. Well, even um, more so. Right. And audience splintering. Um, it is alarming to me when I talk to people who are in the business today and when young interns come in and want to work and you say to them, so where do you get your news? And their answer is my Twitter feed. And we never heard the term fake news before. Did never we? heard the term fake news. <laughs> I can remember one of our news directors when he did interviews with prospective reporters. Mm -hmm. His first question was always, what are the last three books you read and why? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many people were stumped by that question? Mm -hmm. A lot of people were stumped by that question. Now, he didn't care if the book was you yeah. read to your child or it was a textbook in school, but that mm -hmm. you think in terms of depth. And 140 characters is not the way you learn about the news. Indeed. Uh, you, you must have occasion, maybe in your new role and uh, as a former broadcaster, to talk to uh, young people who are considering what kind of career they want. Uh, what would you say to them about a broadcasting career? I've been asked this question very recently, actually, and what I said was, you have to love to learn, and you have to be innately curious. You are not gonna make a lot of money, um, particularly initially. Um, so if money is your driver, this is probably not the career for you. And recognize that at least initially, you're gonna be covering a lot of yellow tape because that is in this instant world we live in, um, the easiest thing to cover and to fill that time up is to show up at a crime scene. And a lot of what you're going to have to do to learn about your community, you're going to have to do on your own time. Um, and I look back and I think, you know, is that so different from, I mean, I did the collective bargaining sessions on my own time. Um, I used to take weekends when I was a new reporter and I would get in my car and I would just drive because I knew that Jacksonville was the largest city and land mass, you know, in the country. And I would just drive and see where it took me. Mm -hmm. And I landed up in different neighborhoods and I just wanted to know what was out there. You know, when, when George was talking about be careful on the west side, you know, there's a tornado warning. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know what that meant. I wanted to be able to visualize the homes and the, and the schools and to understand where, where people were. Um, I, I think that to, to be in journalism today, um, you really have to be committed uh, to knowing the truth. And it's not about being on TV. It never has been about being on TV. Mm. And also, uh, I don't want to fail to uh, mention your family, mm -hmm. an important part of your life. Absolutely. So uh, update us on uh, David and your children. Well, my husband David um, is the light, the love of my life, my best friend. Um, I think one of the most wonderful things about David is he demonstrated how to be a man with integrity to my daughter and my son. Um, that a good marriage, a good relationship, uh, people support the other to be who they are. And he supported me. Um, a lot of people that we knew socially would say, I don't know how you can live with her. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not home at night. You know, you're bathing the kids, you're reading the stories. Um, and there was no mold for that. We, we had no role models um, and we figured it out. And so David's a, David is just a first class human being. And so I think that's one of the reasons my kids are too. <laughs> so my son John and his wife Christy live in Tampa and they have our two year old granddaughter Vivian. And then my daughter Laura is 30 and lives here in Jacksonville. She went into journalism, which Mm -hmm. surprised me. Um, she had started off in political science at the University of Florida and uh, John went into the Marine Corps after a business degree at Florida and served four years. Um, uh, came out actually five years as a captain. He served two tours in Iraq. Um, he is now in commercial real estate. And with Laura, she went into the University of Florida, all Gators, three generations yep. back except for me. Mm -hmm. And um, she called me her second semester sophomore year and said, 
you know, I'm already in like level, 300 level classes in political science and I'm doing well, but I don't think this is what I want to do with my life. Uh, and I said, well, that's fine. You know, you, you don't have to pick a major that leads to a job necessarily if you're interested in it. She goes, well, I, I, I'm kind of, I just don't think this is where I want to be. I said, okay, so sign up for a class that interests you, anything. It's just an elective. She went into college with a lot of credits. She was an IB student, so mm -hmm. she had that luxury. So she took a photography class. And she had always been um, our family photographer. From the time she was a little girl, when she was 11, she started doing all our family videos on vacation. Mm -hmm. And the first roll of film she ever took was with her brother's Fisher Price camera. She was four. Mm -hmm. And you know, you used to have to go to Eckerd's and have it developed, right? right? It's such a <laughs> quaint idea. Such right? a quaint idea. <laughs> and I'll never forget the day I picked up the envelope of those 12 pictures. You know, you had the little Kodak roll of 12, right. and every one of them was framed. She was four. I didn't know how she did that, but she just had this eye. She was a natural athlete as well. Mm -hmm. and, you know, natural athletes have eyes in the back of the head. They always know the position of the ball on the field, they always know mm -hmm. the position of the teammates. Um, so Laura took a photography class and then she calls me and she says, well my photography teacher um, has said he thinks he can get me a scholarship to go to Berlin this summer on a, on a trip he always takes. And I was like, great Laura, that's really cool. Um, so she went on the photography trip and then she started taking advantage of everything that a great big and wonderful university like the University of Florida offers. Mm -hmm. So she went to all of the speeches and workshops and everything offered outside of class time. Uh, she met a Sports Illustrated photographer during that time. And um, on her way back from Berlin, she's in Kennedy Airport, and she says to her photography professor, isn't that Bill Frakes who came to speak to us from Sports Illustrated? She was a big sports fan, mm -hmm. so she had known his work even before he came to the school. He said, yeah, that's, that's him. So she, Laura went up and said, hi, I, I went to your workshop. And, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, oh, that's nice. And um, you know, she was telling him she was a new photography student. And he, he said, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to be in the market for a new assistant um, ah. in the next six months or so. So if you know anybody <laughs> graduating, uh, tell them to, to come and see me. So Laura said, OK. So then lo and behold, they, um, in Atlanta, they realize they're walking to the same airplane. And they're both going to Jacksonville, so they start talking about that. And then they get off, and they're getting their luggage. And Laura goes, "Why are you are you covering something in Jacksonville?" He goes, "No, actually, I live here." Oh, wow! And Laura said, "Really? Well, you know what you said about an assistant? Um, I'd like to be your assistant." And he said, well, "You just told me you just took one course." And she goes, "I'm a really fast learner." <laughs> so he called her that summer um, to literally be a grunt to carry, and you can only imagine a guy, mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine the camera gear. My little 110 pound daughter, who's strong, mm -hmm. carried it through summer heat for 12 and 14 hours at a time. Yeah. And um, they've since formed their own company. Um, mm -hmm. She worked a lot for ESPN when he was, uh, with uh, Sports Illustrated when he was a Sports Illustrated. And now they do a lot of work with ESPN and they also um, have their own company and they do work around the world. So. It's ended up being uh, really something, following your dream. Well, is there anything that uh, you would like to say that I haven't asked you about? Journalism, it's interesting, Harry, as um, I contemplate what retirement looks like long term. You know, I, I always see myself engaged. Mm -hmm. And so even the periods when I wasn't working for a living, I was working at, at what I cared about. And uh, storytelling and having the privilege of having other people tell you their stories is one of the great gifts of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think in some capacity, I will always engage in storytelling somehow. I don't, I don't know what that looks like, but it's really come home to me mm -hmm. um, recently how privileged I have been to hear so many people's stories. One of the most rewarding comments I ever received was after I did a documentary about West Riverside Elementary School and the challenges they were going through to bring that school up in the Florida grading system through using you know, standards-based education and really re just 
reinventing the way students and teachers engage during a classroom day. Um, the teacher in front of the classroom with the back blackboard and then sitting behind her desk, it's gone. But th that's what, when it started to shift. Mm -hmm. And I saw teachers struggle with it. We, we no longer accepted that every class would have a bell curve of students. Mm -hmm. We wanted every child to grow. And when you think about that, when you think about the attack that educators and public education has been under for so many years, and then you look that we are narrowing the achievement gap and the graduation rate is going up, that is because of great teaching. That's why. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm um, covering that story was really exciting for me. I actually took time off from work. I produced it with my own company mm -hmm. and, and Channel 4 aired the documentary. And when we had the premiere, I had one of the teachers come up to me with tears in her eyes afterward, and she said, thank you. You told our story. We didn't even know what it was. And I said, no, no, you told your story. You told your story. You did know what it was. It's just that nobody ever asked you. Deborah Jane Ellis, thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Thank you.